Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. Is anybody interested in, anybody ready for the word of the Lord today? Amen. Grab your Bibles. If you have the ability, stand to your feet, and let's go before the Lord in prayer today. Let's invite the Holy Spirit. Listen, you didn't come to hear from a man or a woman. Never go to church to hear from a man or a woman. We go to church to hear from the true teacher of the church, who is the Holy Spirit. So let's get our eyes off man, get our hearts on God, and let's get ready to receive from the word today. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're grateful that we get to come into your house this day openly, freely, God. We can lift our hands and our hearts to you, God. We can sing to you and encounter your presence as we already have, God. And Lord, what a joy it is to be in your house, God. Today, as we open your word, we pray that you open it up to us, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, open our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Come and be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction, the instruction, even the correction that we need for our lives, Lord. And we give you the praise and the glory for that. God, how awesome you are that you can speak a now word to every heart in this place, God, right where we're at, God. Speak things that I didn't even say today to the heart of the hearer, God. We give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves. Also, we would ask it for our brothers and sisters throughout the world and here in the Inland Empire that are preaching and hearing the gospel. Lord, we love them. At no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. So bless our brothers and sisters. Bless the Baptists, the Lutherans, the Methodists, the Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. God, we thank you for Calvary Chapel, Harvest, for Oak Valley, for the Well and the Way, for Ecclesia, Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist. God, all the great churches out there, too many to mention. God, bless our Catholic brothers and sisters and our Adventist brothers and sisters, Lord. We thank you for the four square denominations and the assemblies. God, if their name in Jesus is Lord and preaching your gospel, Lord, we bless them this day as you would bless us. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say... Man, you can have a seat. Turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews, the ninth chapter. Hebrews, the ninth chapter. We're going to be talking about a subject today called a dedicated life. And we'll find out what that means as we go through the text of Hebrews, chapter number nine. Now, let me preface what we're going to be talking about today just by saying this. Oftentimes in the Bible, you ever read the Bible and you kind of wondered, you know, what on earth is God talking about? You know, why would God include that in the scriptures? I know sometimes I've been reading and I thought, well, I wonder why God specifically said the type of tree that it was. You know, talking about like Deborah sat under a palm tree. Why did God think it was important enough to include in the Bible that he would point something out like that? Sometimes he talks about colors. Sometimes he talks about who was in the room. Sometimes he talks about what was going on in the world at that time. And you kind of wonder and you kind of scratch your head and say, God, why would you include that in the Bible? It's sort of a little side note or it, it, it seems like it's something maybe insignificant that we would have skipped over. Now, sometimes when, I know personally when I read stuff like that in the Bible, there's times where I understand it, and I, I understand it at a certain level, and I never dig any deeper. Other times where I understand it, and maybe I, 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 I think that I've got it, but really there's more to the story than that. Then there's times where I really don't have any idea, and maybe you're like me and you do this, and you read over it, and, and you don't understand it, so what do you do? You read real fast to the next part that you do understand, and you say, oh, I got that, you know, right? And you kind of skip over what's being said because it's really kind of hard to understand. You don't really want to dig into it. Now, the Hebrew believers that are reading this text thousands of years ago would have understood what is being said here because they understood the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. However, as believers today, we are under a new covenant, we're no longer under the Old Covenant. So some of these pictures, these images that we're going to see today are not as vivid as they were back then. Why? Because we're not as closely associated with them. They're not right there in our face speaking to us so that when we see the reality under the New Covenant, now all of a sudden we're kind of scratching our heads going, what is God saying? These verses that we're going to encounter today are like that. But I believe that as the Spirit of God opens our eyes and as we take a look in the Word, we're going to see what it is God has for our lives today. Hebrews 9, chapter, verse number 18 through verse number 21. Hebrews 9, chapter, starting verse number 18, starts out with the word, therefore. Remember, therefore is there for a reason. In other words, he's saying because of what I just said. You remember last week we talked about counsel we can count on. We talked about the image of Jesus. He is our mediator. Uh, big, big idea, but very beautifully expressed by Pastor Luke about substitution, how Jesus came and, and how Jesus was the substitute who took our place. Pretty awesome stuff. Remember we talked about how he has given us an inheritance, how this is the last will and testament that was now given to us, okay? So because of all that, because of what I just said about that, therefore not even the first covenant was dedicated 
without blood. We've been talking a lot about blood lately, but listen, we're on the road to the cross in these coming weeks. We're headed into the Passion Week next week, and we're going to be seeing what took place in Jesus' life, and you cannot encounter Jesus without first encountering His blood on the way to the cross. Verse number 19, for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. Now, right there, we should all stop and say, what did God just say? Why would God include those things in there? Why was it important enough not just to say that Moses took blood and sprinkled it on the people? Why did he have to include these things, the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, hyssop? You say, hiss what? Hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. Well, we're going to find out today. Let's read on. Verse number 20 saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Now, we're going to stop right there for this week. And we'll continue these thoughts in the book of Hebrews as we go along. But God is speaking something to us. God is telling us something. And as we take a look at the images of what is taking place here in the word of God, we will find out not just about a history lesson. This is not just about something. See, sometimes people take a look at this stuff and they say, oh, that's just telling us where we came from. That's just telling us what happened. Listen, it's more than that. Listen, the church is not an educational institution. This is a hospital. This is where sick people come to get healed. There's blood all over the place. It's the blood of Jesus, and it's meaningful. It's significant. Come on, somebody. This is life to us. This is what God is speaking to us here and now today. This is the living, moving, acting, breathing word of God for our lives. And therefore, it is not insignificant. It's not just an afterthought. God didn't just burp up a pizza and say, well, I guess I'll include that in there. No, God is speaking something to our lives here and now today. And so as we take a look, we find out that therefore not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. There had to be a life given that sealed that covenant. And that life was given under the first covenant. And yes, it was a sacrificial lamb, it was a goat, it was an animal there. But now Jesus has inaugurated the new covenant with his own blood. He has sealed us with his blood. He has shed his blood now, and now we can enter into this new covenant relationship. But you cannot get to Jesus without his blood. It must be with the blood. And now we see in verse number 19, for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, what did he do? He, he received the commandment from the Lord. And then Moses came, and he delivered that to the people. He read the book of the law in the hearing of all the people. All the people agreed to it. They said, all that the Lord has commanded us to do, we will do. So then Moses says, okay, that's cool. We're going to do that now. And what does he do? He takes scarlet wool. He wraps it around a bunch of hyssop. He takes the blood of the sacrificial lamb in water, and he dips it in that, and then he sprinkles it on the people, and he sprinkles it on the book itself. That's quite an image when you take a look at it. But what is the Bible telling us about See, that life is given, and now that life is applied to the people under the covenant benefits, covenant terms, and as well, it's applied to the book itself. And see, in the new covenant, Jesus has sprinkled us. We are made alive by the blood of Jesus, and now our conscience are cleansed. And therefore, the blood has been applied to us. But listen, the blood was also applied to the book. That means that this book is not a dead book. This is not just written words on a page. This is a book that is alive. This is a living book. This is a speaking book. See, Jesus is the word of God to us now today. Jesus now, the expressed image of God, the image of the Father, moving, living, breathing, acting, doing. He is alive, and now this book is not a dead book. Now this book is life to all those who will receive of it, and it speaks to us today. Then it goes on and it says, and likewise he sprinkled the book, both the blood, both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Continues on and says, almost all the instruments were sealed with that blood. They were given the life. They were sealed in covenant. So a dedicated life, we see that that first covenant was dedicated with blood. And now today we are dedicated to the Lord. Maybe you didn't realize this when you gave your heart to Jesus. But now you have dedicated your life. You have gone into a new covenant relationship. There's an agreement in heaven between God the Father and God the Son, and now we are the benefactors. And when you say yes to Jesus, you enter into that covenant. So today I want to talk to you about a life dedicated to Christ. A life dedicated to Christ is a couple of things, and we're going to see these and pull out some truths from the Word of God in Hebrews 9th chapter as we go today. A life dedicated to Christ is, number one, dedicated with blood. A life dedicated to Christ is, number one, dedicated with blood. And notice I put up on the overheads, Jesus' blood. 
See, not just any blood will do. Couldn't be the blood of any man because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Couldn't be the blood of bulls and goats and calves and that sort of a thing. Why? Because that was an animal and that was acceptable under the old covenant. But now under this new covenant, it had to be a member of our family. It had to be likened to us. had to be our kin. And therefore, Jesus was the only one who qualified. He was the perfect, spotless, sinless Lamb of God who now shed his blood for us. And therefore, when we dedicate our life to Christ, now it's dedicated with blood, Jesus' blood. Just like Moses took the blood of the offering and he sprinkled it on the people and on the book and on the tabernacle and on all the vessels of the ministry, so also when we dedicated our life to the Lord, now we are sprinkled with the blood of Jesus and it cleanses our conscience. We talked about that in the book of Hebrews. Many times when people come to the Lord, that's the first thing that they see. They see Jesus taking on their sin. Maybe this was you. You heard about Jesus, right? And you were such a rascal, such a sinner. My goodness, you had practiced and you had perfected your craft of sinning, right? Many of us were that way before Christ. And, and, and so you felt guilty. You felt bad. You felt dirty. You felt shame. You felt guilt. You felt condemnation. And you thought, my goodness, God doesn't want to have anything to do with me. But then somebody told you about Jesus. And they told you how he lived a perfect, spotless, sinless life. And you said, well, what does that have to do with me? And they said, well, because Jesus was perfect, now he is qualified to take your sin off of you. And he has taken it on himself. And he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. Many times when we encounter Jesus, the first thing we see him as is the one who has taken the sin. See, Jesus took the sin of the world upon him, though he had no sin in him. Are you listening today? Let me say that again. Jesus took the sin of the world upon him, though he had no sin in him. Remember, Moses took scarlet wool. What is that speaking of? Scarlet was a stained fabric. It was dyed. You were not going to get that stain out. That scarlet was permanent. And so that scarlet wool, we know that the wool came from a lamb, represented Jesus. And when you first encounter Jesus, you see him wearing that scarlet robe. In fact, on our way to the cross, when we take a look at Easter, oftentimes we see images of Jesus. And you remember the soldiers coming and mocking. Turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 27. Soldiers came and they had flogged Jesus. They had beaten him. He had been whipped. He'd been mocked. They pulled his beard out, punching him in the face, spitting on him. Matthew chapter 27. And then what did they do? They wrapped together a crown of thorns. And they press it down on his head. And then they take a purple robe or a scarlet robe and they lay it on him. Matthew chapter 27 verse 28. Let's take a look at it. Look at this. And they stripped him, and they put a scarlet robe on him. They didn't realize what they were doing at the time. They were mocking. They were making fun of him. They were putting him down. But they didn't realize what they were doing was symbolic for our time, that we would know that Jesus was that Lamb of God, that he put on that scarlet robe for us. Remember, Pilate brought him out before the Jews, and what does he say? He says, behold the man. And now we as Christians, we behold Jesus. And before we come to him and give our lives to him, we need to see him as that Lamb of God who's taking away our sin. He had the sin of the world placed on him. My sin, my stain, my, my dirtiness was now placed on Jesus Christ. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Martin Luther said this. He said, either sin is with you lying on your shoulders or it is lying on Christ, the Lamb of God. Now, if it is lying on your back, you are lost. But if it is resting on Christ, you are free, and you will be saved. Now choose what you want. Isn't that a great quote? See, for us, we need to see Jesus taking our sin upon him. But remember that the blood of Jesus is no ordinary blood. This is a supernatural blood. This is not like in the world. See, our sin and our stain, we couldn't take care of it ourselves. You ever had blood on, on one of your, your garments? You know, you got a little blood on it. Maybe you cut your finger and, oh, man, I've got it. My, my shirt messed up. You pull off the white shirt and you pull it off, right? And you go and you got the stain cleaner stuff, maybe some OxyClean and you're trying to get it out. Shirt's ruined, right? Nothing really works. You know, maybe you got some miracle stuff, but bleach, all that kind of stuff doesn't really get the job done. See, our sin was like that stain. And yet Jesus comes with his blood. And when we dip our sin, our robe, our stain-filled life into the blood of Jesus, it doesn't get stained crimson anymore. Now it comes out pure and white. Amen. Let me show this to you in the Word in Isaiah chapter 
number one, verse number 18, look at what he says. He says, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Isn't that a great invitation from God? God is saying, come on, let's talk this thing out. Let's, let's reason together. Look at what he says. Though your sins are like what? Scarlet. They shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. See, that's that scarlet thread of redemption that's wrapped around our lives. So a life dedicated to Christ is, number one, dedicated with blood, Jesus' blood. Second thing for today, a life dedicated to Christ is, number two, washed in the water. Remember that Moses, when he came and he was dedicating, what did he do? It says that he took the blood of calves and lambs, right? And then what did he do? With water. With water. We're given many pictures in the Bible of the washing of water. Even on the Day of Atonement, as the high priest was going towards the temple, towards the tabernacle, and he's going to go into the presence of God behind the veil, the first thing that you would encounter on your way into the presence of God was the altar. See, that blood is the very first place that we start. But then right after that, there was a large basin of water called the bronze laver. And this is the picture that we get of the water. See, the high priest, you can imagine as he slaughtered that lamb, that sacrificial lamb, and as he slit its throat and caught the blood in a bowl, he would have gotten blood on himself. He was wearing a linen garment. That linen garment would have picked up that blood. But not only that, he would take, after he drained the blood out of that animal, he would take that animal, he would go and he would burn it on the altar completely charred. And so he would have came out smelling like smoke. He would have came out with ashes all over him. Therefore, he would have been very dirty. And so what did he have to do? Was he going to go into the presence of God all dirty? See, no, he was going into the presence of Almighty God. Therefore, he had to wash himself. He had to get cleaned. And so he would go into this bronze labor. It was a large basin of water, and it had four bulls on, on the underneath part of it, and they were holding it up. And so, therefore, he would climb into this thing, and he would wash himself in the water. He would get all that blood off of his hands, and he would get all that ash and, and all that smell of smoke off of himself. And then he would come out, and he would change his garments. He would get out of that linen garment, and he would get into the high priestly robes. And he would put that on, and he would have a breastplate that had the, the different stones on it. They had the different names of the tribes of Israel carrying the weight of the sin of the, the nation on his shoulders. And it had the name holiness unto the Lord. And therefore, he would go into the presence of Almighty God clean and new and fresh. See, the image that we get today is a baptism. Remember John the Baptist? And John the Baptist, what did he say? He said, repent and be baptized each one of you. And it wasn't just cleaning the flesh. No, it wasn't just about the outside. He was talking about the heart. Mend your works. Mend your ways. Jesus comes and now he is baptized, right? And he's giving us a picture that we need in our lives to walk in obedience to the word of God. It's just an amazing thing. You know, thinking about this and studying this out, I found an interesting story written by a guy by the name of Boyce Mouton. He writes in 1818, Ignaz Philip Simmelweis. What a name is that, right? But he was a doctor and he was born into a world of dying women. The finest hospitals lost one in six young mothers to what was called childbed fever. A doctor's daily routine began in the dissecting room where he performed autopsies. From there, he made his way to the hospital to examine expectant mothers without ever pausing to wash his hands. Dr. Simonweis was the first man in history to associate such examinations with a resultant infection and death. His own practice was to wash with a chlorine solution, and after 11 years and the delivery of 8,537 babies, he lost only 184 mothers, about one in 50. That's quite a better result, don't you think? One in six to one in 50? He spent the vigor of his life lecturing and debating with his colleagues. Once he argued, purple fever is caused by decomposed material conveyed to a wound. I have shown how it can be prevented. I have proved all that I have said. But while we talk, 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 gentlemen, women are dying. I'm not asking for anything world-shaking. I'm asking you only to wash. For God's sake, wash your hands. But virtually no one believed him. Doctors and midwives had been delivering babies for thousands of years without washing. And no unspoken, outspoken Hungarian was going to change them now. Simon Wise died insane at the age of 47. His wash basins discarded, his colleagues laughing in his face. See, the Spirit of God is speaking to us today, and he's saying, for God's sake, wash. 
See, the road dust of the world gets on our lives. The, 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 there's blood on our hands. There's stains that can come upon us. I get the picture, you know, you ever thought about uh, the, the guy that's getting ready for work and he's there in his suit and he goes to the bus stop and he's standing there waiting for the bus and a car drives by and that big old puddle just of mud flies all up over him, right? And he's just standing there like, what? I didn't do anything to stand here. See, life can be dirty. Life can be messy. There are going to be things in your life that can get on you. And yet, even though you're washed in the blood, you still have to now wash in the water. The Bible gives us a picture of how we do this. Let's take a look at it in the book of Ephesians this time, the book of Ephesians. In the book of Ephesians, the fifth chapter, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, and he's talking to them about marriage. As he talks to them about marriage, he starts to speak to them and tell them that it's not just marriage here on earth, but it's an image, it's a picture of Christ and the church. That's why marriage is so important. That's why marriage is, is so necessary in the body of Christ, that we make sure that we stay, if we're married, that we make sure that we stay in the love of God, that we stay in forgiveness, that, that we, we readily overlook an offense. Why? Because the devil would love to break up marriages so that he can break up that image of Christ and the church here on the earth. But he goes on to start talking about some principles and some context. And most of the time when we read these verses, we read them about marriage. But take a look at what he's saying when it comes to our everyday Christian life. Ephesians, the fifth chapter, starting in verse number 25. We're going to read through verse number 27. Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verse number 25 starts out and says this. Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Remember that Christ's love was a sacrificial love. He gave his life. But then it goes on to say in verse number 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Isn't that interesting? He says that he wants to sanctify and cleanse the church. See, sanctification is that setting apart for God's holy purposes that you are ready to serve the living God and that you should be cleansed. How? With the washing of water. There's that water. How? By the word. And then he goes on in verse number 27, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. See, every day you need to get into the word of God. Why? Because every day the world is going to try and get on you. There's going to be that road dust of the week. There's going to be those things that you hear, those things that you see that are going to spot you. They're going to get on you and you're going to be dirty. And therefore, even though you are a saint, spiritually you are clean before God. In the natural, you're going to have to clean yourself up. That's why it's so important that we watch what we watch. That we're careful about what we listen to. That we get rid of things and we don't put anything in front of our eyes that would, that would sear our consciences or be displeasing in the eyes of the Lord. Why? Because that stuff gets on you. And therefore, you've got to get the word in you. And you need to start washing in the water of the word so that you can go before the presence of God cleansed. Sometimes people say, well, you Christians have no fun. You know, you don't watch any movies, you don't listen to music, you know, and, and I just can't stand. You Christians are just brainwashed. You know what? I am brainwashed. I have cleaned my brain with the washing of the water by the word, and I no longer think those filthy old thoughts. I'm no longer bound by that junk. It's dirty, and I don't want to have any part in it. I want to be clean before my Lord. My goodness, and God good to us. Every day we need to wash in the water of the word. Get what you can. You say, Pastor, I don't read that much. I'm not that good of a reader. You know what I'm saying? I'm in a Dino and the California school system's all messed up. And I'm a product of that, Pastor. Well, guess what? So am I. But you don't have to stay that way. God can give you a new mind. God can give you understanding. You can be wiser than your instructors. And all you got to do is get what you can. Get one little verse. Listen to the word. Read the word. Get into church. Get what you can, and God will bring you to new heights, new levels, as you wash in the water of the word each and every day. Are you listening today? So what are we talking about? A life dedicated to Christ is number one, dedicated with blood. Number two, washed in the water. Number three, number three for us today, applied in faith. Applied in faith. Now, I could have said lived in faith. You know, that's a cool way to say that. You know, you're living out your life, and you need to live a life that is faith-filled and faithful, you know. And, and I could have said that. But really, when I take a look at the Word of God in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, I don't find just living out. I find that there has to be effort. There has to be an application of the faith that you have in the blood and in the water. Let's take a look at it together. Hebrews, if you want to turn back there with me real quick, just want to give you this image one more time. Hebrews, the ninth chapter. And in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, we read that when Moses had spoken every precept to the people, 
Look at what he does. He takes the blood, Hebrews the ninth chapter. Let me get there myself. I'm quoting it. Hebrews the ninth chapter, verse number 19. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool. We've talked about both those. And then look at this. And hyssop. Sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. Now, hyssop, we don't really know what that is. But hyssop is all throughout the Bible. In fact, you'll find it there at the cross. When they gave that vinegar to Jesus, they filled it with a sponge and they put it on hyssop and they lifted it up to Jesus' mouth. Probably the most famous time that we see hyssop in the Bible is during the Passover. You remember the, the Jews, they were instructed by the Lord to take a Passover lamb and slaughter it. And they were to take the blood and they were to roast the lamb. They were to eat the lamb, not leave any part of the lamb. But then they took the blood and what did they do? They took a bunch of hyssop. They grabbed a hold of that, pulled it out, and they had to dip that hyssop there in the bowl. And as they were to shake that, now you, you got to look at me, okay? Everybody look up here. Take a look at what they would do. They had to take that hyssop. They had to dip it in the blood. And then they had to shake that hyssop on their door. They had to go top to bottom and left to right. Did you see that right now? They had to take that bunch of hyssop. They had to dip it there in the blood. And then they had to go top to bottom and left to right. And now their house was covered and they would he passed over when judgment came to Egypt. See, in our lives, we need to get a hold of the things of God. And we need to apply them to our life so that we're completely covered, top to bottom, left to right, with the things of God. Every day, applying the word of God to our life. Can you say amen? amen. See, all throughout the Bible, if you read in the book of Leviticus, you'll find hyssop. And if you look in the book of Numbers, you'll find the hyssop. When there was a leper that was cleansed, they would take water. And they would take blood and they would dip the hyssop and they would apply it to that leper's life. If there was a house that had mold in it, they would take water and blood and they would take hyssop and they would dip it and then they would apply it to that house for the cleansing. There was a red heifer offering. See, red, talking about blood now. And they would completely burn that to ash and then they would take the ash outside of the camp. And whenever somebody touched a bone or a dead body or any such thing and now they needed to be cleansed, they needed to be clean once again in the eyes of God, they had to take that bunch of hyssop, they had to take the ash of that heifer that was given and water and they would take that together and then they would sprinkle it on the unclean. See, it was applied to their life and that's what we need to do with the word and with the water and with the blood each and every day we need to get a hold of the things of God wrap them together that blood and that water and now we dip it and we apply it to our life let me say this the word and the blood will do you no good unless they are applied can I say that again the word and the blood will do you no good unless they are applied. Listen, you could read this all day, all night, but if you never do any of it, it's not going to do you any good. Book of James tells us that a man who looks into the perfect law of liberty but does not continue in it is a forgetful hearer. See, it's like a man observing his face in the mirror, looks at himself and says, man, I am filthy, I'm messed up, I'm missing teeth, my hair's a mess, and then he walks away and thinks, my goodness, I'm handsome. But see, God is telling us, you need to apply the blood, and you need to apply the word, you need to wash and be cleansed, and that way, as you apply it to your life each and every day, now that's going to get the job done. King David understood this, because in the Bible, it talks about King David in Psalms, the 51st chapter. Now, maybe you don't know the background of Psalm, the 51st chapter, but David had just royally blew it. Anybody ever royally blew it other than Pastor Dan in this place? See, we all mess up. We all know we've done stuff that we're not proud of. Even after you were a Christian, something happened in your life. And here's King David. What happened in his life? Well, he didn't go out to war when he should have, right? So he's procrastinating, hanging around, not doing what he should be doing. Okay? Not necessarily in sin, but just not doing what he should have been doing. So he's in the wrong place at the wrong time, sees the wrong thing, right? He lusts after a woman. Then what does he do? He calls for her. So he acts on his lusts. Now he commits adultery. Then he, he realizes, oh my goodness, she's pregnant. So what does he do? He goes into cover-up mode. Now all of a sudden he tries to bring in her husband and, and he gets him drunk, right? And now he's causing someone else to stumble. Then what does he do? He tries to send him back so that it'll look like he had the baby and not King David. So what happens? Now all of a sudden here this guy won't do it. So he sends him out and now the cover-up gets bigger. He says, I want you to put him on the front lines of battle and then draw away from him so that he'll be killed by the hands of the enemy. Now David has essentially committed murder. See, he's just stacking sin on top of sin. So then, as it happens, now Joab sends word back, and he says, you know what? Uriah the Hittite is dead, and, and, and don't be displeased. And so King David says, oh, you know what? That's all right. Stuff happens, but don't let this thing be evil in your eyes. Now he's telling Joab, the leader of his army, to accept his sin. 
See, he just keeps stacking thing on top of thing, on top of thing, on top of thing. And then he brings Bathsheba to be his wife, thinking that that'll make everything okay. And people will think it's all right that they're having a child together now that they're married, now that her husband is dead. It's all right. That's fine, David. It's cool. You're all good. And yet the Bible records for the very first time in this section of Scripture, 2 Samuel, that this thing displeased the Lord. Very first time you ever read that God was displeased with David. So what does God do? God sends a prophet to him by the name of Nathan. Nathan comes to David and tells him a little story about a little lamb, right? A little poor man that had a ewe lamb that he loved, slept in his bed, was like one of his children. And, and, and then there was a rich man. The rich man was rich and wealthy and had all this stuff, had plenty of lambs, but he didn't want to use one of his lambs when a traveler came to him. So what did he do? He took the poor man's little lamb and he slaughtered it and gave it to the traveler that came to his house. David was incensed. He was so angry that he said, that man should die. And Nathan points his finger in his face and says, you are that man. David repents before the Lord, says, I've sinned against God. He accepts the judgment of the Lord and he repents before God. And take a look at the words in Psalm 51. Now David is pouring out his heart to the Lord about this whole thing. Psalm 51, verse number 7, look at what he says. He says, purge me with hyssop. Lord, apply the cleansing power of the blood and the water to my life. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. See, David understood something. David understood that the application of the word of God to his life was going to get the job done. Now, I know we're talking in terms of repentance and forgiveness, and yes, that applies to our life, but listen, this should be in every area of our life, not just for when we mess up, but listen, for your family, for your finances, for your business, for your future, for your witness in the community, for everything that you put your hand to, you need to get a hold of the things of God and apply the blood of Jesus and the word of God to your life, top to bottom, left to right, every day you need to get a hold of that and saturate your life with it. Can you say amen today? Last verse for today, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians, turn there with me. 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. God is giving promises to us. He says he will be our God, will be his people, will be called his sons and his daughters. Great promises from the word of God. 2 Corinthians chapter number 7, verse number 1. Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians the 7 chapter, verse number 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, I want you to notice something. I want you to notice that it didn't say, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us make God cleanse us. Did it say that? I'm sorry, did it say that? No. No, it did not. See, God has already cleansed us by the blood of Jesus. Spiritually, we are clean. So what does he say? He says, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us go to church and make the pastor cleanse us. Right? Pastor Dan needs to do that when you come in. Did it say that? No, no, it did not. See, what is the responsibility? The responsibility is let us cleanse ourselves. See, we have a responsibility to keep ourselves, look at this, from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Filthiness of the flesh and spirit. See, there are things in the natural. If you've got videos and things like that you need to get rid of, get rid of them. Delete them. Crack the DVD, the Blu-ray. Get rid of the magazines. Get rid of the stuff. Put a filter on your internet. Whatever you have to do, get rid of the music. Just get that stuff. Delete it off of your phone, your, your, your iPod, your iPad, all that. Just get rid of that stuff. Get it out of your life. If there's ungodly associations, get it out of there. If you've got stuff in your house you know that you should not have, get it out of your house. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit. See, that's why the Lord tells us, Jesus talks about the things that go into our lamp of the body, the eyes. Whatever you put in front of yourself, be careful about it. Why? Because if you're putting in darkness, he says, how great is that darkness? We've got to keep ourselves, cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit. Look at this, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Listen, I'm not here to preach down on you today and tell you how bad you are. I'm in this with you. That verse right there should give us all encouragement. Why? Because we are all on the road. We're all on the way. We're all perfecting. See, that's a process that God is doing in our life. We messed up. We tripped up. We didn't know how to do it. We didn't know how we are going to make it. But now we apply the word of God and we are perfecting this. We're getting better at it. We're going from glory to glory, from one place to another place, from strength to strength, the Bible says. And we're all on an upward scale with God. I love what Francis Bacon said. I'll close with this. He said that it's not what we preach but what we practice that makes us Christians. Each and every one of our lives, the blood and the water will do us no good unless it's applied. 
to our life. So what did we learn today? We learned that a life dedicated to Christ is number one, dedicated with blood, the blood of Jesus. Number two, we learned that a life dedicated to Christ is washed in the water. And number three, we learned that a life dedicated to Christ is applied in faith. Can we say that together real quick? Let's say that together. Dedicated with blood, washed in the water, applied in faith. Say it with me, okay? Ready? Now that you got it. Dedicated with blood, washed in the water, applied in faith. Let's say it again. Dedicated with blood, washed in the water, applied in faith. Say it like you mean it. Come on now. Dedicated with blood, washed in the water, applied in faith. Can you give the Lord a great big praise today? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey, I want to talk to you guys. You guys have been great today. I want to thank you guys. This has been wonderful. But even though we've had a great time in church, and haven't we? Even though we've felt the presence of God and some of you guys got touched by the Spirit, even though we've heard the word of the Lord, it'd be a tragedy if we stopped there and you died and went to hell, didn't go to heaven. Now, sometimes when I say that word hell, people get offended. And they say, well, Pastor, I don't believe in hell. You know, that's not real. That's a fairy tale. That's a fable. That's just something that people invented in order to scare people into being good. Listen, that's not true because the Bible talks about hell. It's not man's invention. Hell was made for the devil and his angels, never intended for us. And yet it's spoken of in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. In fact, Jesus himself talked about hell. It's a very real place. And just by burying your head in the sand and denying its existence doesn't make it go away. You're going to have to deal with the reality of it. So let's make sure you don't go there today. Come on, listen up. This is your eternal destiny that's at stake. I'm going to ask everybody, please remain seated. Bunches of people are just getting up and walking out. Let's respect the move of the Spirit of God right now. And Christians, be praying. And let's talk about your eternal destiny that's at stake right now. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, I believe all roads lead to heaven. You know, just do your thing, I'll do my thing. As long as we stay true to ourselves, we're going to go to heaven. But the problem with that thing is that's like saying all roads lead to the moon. Did you know that all roads don't lead to the moon? You say, well, that goes without saying, pastor. There's only one way you've got to get there. Yes, yes, you're onto it. See, because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man goes to the Father except by me. That means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Can't get there your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way or just stay true to yourself and God sees that and lets you into heaven. You've got to get there God's way. Don't you think God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption and carried it out in his son Jesus, beaten, bloody, and hung on a cross, don't you think if he went through all of that to get us to heaven, don't you think that he would share with us how to get to heaven? Well, he does in his word. Now, sometimes people say, well, pastor, that's good news because, you know, uh, I know the Bible says just be good and you get to go to heaven. And I've been a really good person, used to be bad, cleaned up my act, now I'm good and I know that's going to get me into heaven. And, you know, my, my good really outweighs my bad, so it's cool. I, I've given money to charity, helped out people, been nice to my neighbors and got involved in social justice causes. Therefore, I know God sees that and he's going to let me into heaven because I've been good enough. And can I ask you a question? How good is good enough? Can you show me in the Bible where it says be this good or the standard? Can you show me the, the curve line that you have to be above in order to get in? Because it's not there. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can be good enough to get into heaven. You're not going to make it there on your own merit or based on your own goodness. In fact, the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're not going to make it on your own. You've already messed up. The standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. And our goodness compared to God's goodness is like filthy rags, the Bible says. They're going to be thrown out. Not going to get to stay. Not going to make it to heaven just by being good. You see, but Pastor, hold on a second. I was raised in church. My parents told me we were Christians growing up. I wore a cross or St. Christopher around my neck. Had, had me baptized or christened as a child. And, and, and went to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. I always thought of myself as a Christian. Born in America. America is a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, denying hell, right? Wrong. So that nowhere in the Bible. Check it out. Nowhere. Does it say that you're raised in church, parents tell you you're a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you wear religious jewelry, attend religious classes, be baptized as a Christian as a child, or think of yourself as a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you were born in America or that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Listen, let me love you enough respect you enough and honor you enough to tell you the truth, if that's how you think you're going to get to heaven, you're not going to make it. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, Pastor, not only when I was a child did I go to church, here I'm sitting in church in front of you right now, and I, I consider myself to be a Christian. Well, you know what that's like doing? That's like going to the Pacific Ocean, sitting in the water, calling yourself a fish, and thinking that's going to make you a fish. 
It doesn't work like that. You can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. You say, but hold on a second, Pastor. I, I got involved in my last church, sang in the choir for a number of years, helped out, carried the pastor Bible, made decisions. People thought of me as a leader, even taught in the Bible class and got a membership card to that church. I'm good, very glad you did those things. Could you just, could you just show that to me in the Bible? Where that gets you into heaven, where you help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader, teaching the Bible classes, singing the choir. Or that because you got a membership card to a church, God is looking for your membership card before you can enter the gates of heaven. It doesn't work like that. Come on, let's talk about your life. Let's talk about your soul. Your eternal destiny is at stake right now. Let's listen up. Give God your attention. You say, but hold on a second, Pastor. I know God. I know who he is. I, I celebrate Christmas and sing the songs every year of my life. About to celebrate Easter and the resurrection. Could quote scriptures to you, Pastor, Old and New Testament. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. Just show that to me in the Bible where that gets you into heaven. Where you're having head knowledge about who Jesus is gets you right with God. See, if you'd read your Bible, you'd know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is Son of God. They're not Christians. If you'd read your Bible, you would know that the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures out of his mouth. And yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. Look up here. This is not about what you have in your head. It's not about having mental assent towards God, knowing who he is, or being able to quote some scriptures or celebrate a holiday. But rather, this is about your heart. God has always been after your heart. Old and New Testament, God is looking for your heart. Jesus came to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. He was a good guy. Did a lot of good deeds. Raised up in his church called the synagogue. Got involved. In fact, he became one of the leaders. He held to the strictest form of the law. He could quote the scripture. He could debate the scripture. How many of us could do this? He could sing the scripture. When he gave his money, people would sound trumpets. People looked to him to find out about God. We would have thought if anybody was going to heaven, it would have been this guy, Nicodemus. We would have thought Jesus would have came to him and said, Nick, man, you are so cool. You're just doing a great job. Keep doing what you're doing. I'll see you in heaven. But he doesn't say that at all. Rather, what does he say? He says, Nicodemus, you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? You must be born again. Now, I know a lot of people turn off when I make those statements, being born again, because they think of Hollywood and television, movies, books, the internet, and they say, I heard about that, oh, that's weirdo stuff, that's crazy, that's just not, you know, that's, that's stuff I don't want to be involved in, but listen, it's not about what the world says, not about what society says, or media, television, Hollywood, books, movies, or the internet, rather it's about what the Bible says. What does being born again really mean from the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. Just that simple. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what is he talking about? What's lukewarm mean? Well, it's a little in, a little out. A little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and again. Occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today I'm going to give you an opportunity. Let's not leave you there. Let's make sure that if you died today, that you would end up going to heaven and not go to hell. How do we do that? Well, here's your opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three, just like this. One, two, three. Bang! Pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that, bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You might be thinking, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh. You might be, let's get over that. Let's get past that embarrassment today. Think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? Listen, no one's that dumb. But the devil thinks that you are. That's why he's trying to talk you out of it right now. There's a battle going on in your flesh and in your mind and warring against you, saying, ah, you're going to be embarrassed. What are people going to think? Listen, push past all that. And let's go for God today because it's better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better. Let's go for God today. Listen, this is a safe and friendly church. No one's judging you. No one's criticizing you, condemning you, laughing at you. Listen, we're all brothers and sisters here in the Lord. We love you and we want you to do this. In fact, we're rooting for you right now. We're hoping that you do this and we'll celebrate you. 
Okay? So you can do that in a safe and friendly church service today. Who should raise their hand? You've been running from God instead of to God. I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on today, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, giving him all of your heart and all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Finally, who should do this? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can get right with God wherever you're at. Back in the family room, so I'm talking to you. Out there in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, hey, get ready to put the burrito down, the burger down. You can get your hand up and then tell an usher right afterwards or come into the church service. If you're watching online, hey, get ready to get your hand up. God sees where you're at right now. And then you can click the button on your browser that says respond to God or on our homepage. How to know God, and then someone will lead you in a prayer right there, wherever you're at, all over the world. Let's go for God today. I'm going to pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Get ready to get your hands up. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. He's got two hands up. All right. Praise the Lord. Seven, eight, nine. Thank you. Ten. Thank you. Eleven. Up there. Gotcha. Twelve. Thank you. Thirteen. God bless you. Where are you at? 13 wise people, 13, 14 back in the family rooms, thank you. 15 up there, gotcha, thank you. 16 over there, gotcha over there. Thank you guys, you can put your hands down if I got you already. Anybody else that I didn't already see? 16, 17, gotcha down there, thank you. God bless you. Who else today? 17 wise people, you're saying, I, I know I need to do this, Pastor. I need to give God all my heart, I need to give God all my life. Is there anybody else in this place? You're saying, yeah, I, I know I need to. No, I need to. Where are you at? Or yeah, just pop it up, pop it up if that's you. Don't wait another minute. Don't wait another minute. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? Is there anybody else? You're saying, yeah, oh, my heart's beating out of my chest. I know the Holy Spirit's tugging on it right now. Come on, let's go for God today. Is there anybody else? Anybody else? Come on, just raise up high when I'm looking your direction, if that's you. Anybody else? Come on, let's go for God today. Up on top, thank you. Thank you, number 18. Come on, we're at number 19. Number 19, you were waiting. You were waiting. You're saying, ah. Man, there's a struggle going on, but yeah, you need to do this. Who else today? Where are you at, number 19? Just pop it up when I'm looking in your direction. Is that a hand up there? Wave it at me if it is. No? All right. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right. Well, let's give the Lord a hand for 18 wise people. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is so good to us. All right. Now, listen, you don't get saved by raising your hand. You've got to invite Jesus to come into your heart. So we want to pray with you, all right? But we can't do that till we get you down here. So no one leave during this time. In a moment, we're all going to stand. We're all going to give a clap and a shout and welcome you as Elijah leads us in a song. And if that's who you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, but you didn't, number 19, number 20, hey, it's not too late for you either. Once you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend, whatever you brought with you to church, get your stuff, get your friend if you need it, and then I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies today. So let's all stand and welcome them. You raised your hand. You should have raised your hand. You come right now. Just make your way to the front. Come on down. Come on, come on, come on. Won't you come? Just as you are. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. Oh, and hear the Spirit. Come on, you can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Won't you come just as you are? Come, come on, you can come too. You can come too. Let your neighbor say, friend, I'll go with you. Come on down. Let's go. Let's go. They're still coming. You can come too. In the family rooms, you can bring your children. They'll remember this. Come on down. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Just taste the living water. Anybody else, if you need to come, you just make your way to the front right now. Come on down. Come on down. Come on down. He'll give you life. All right, everybody. Look up here. Put a big smile on your face. This is a good thing. It's not a bad thing, okay? Came to give God all your heart. Came to give God all of your life. You're going to be born again, headed for heaven, denying hell. That's a good thing, all right? I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine. See this guy in the blue sweater over here? This is Antonio, or you can call him Tony. He, he goes by Tony, too. He's a cool guy, right? Nothing weird is going to go on. I'm going to let you know what he's going to do. He's going to take you right over there and lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again, okay? Then he's going to give you some free stuff, some free information, some free literature. Read about what you just did, what just happened, and what to do next. Listen, it's easy reading, and, and you need to take some time out and find out, okay, now that I'm a Christian... What should I do? Okay, that free literature he gives you will help you to find that out. Then, right afterwards, he's going to give you what we call a spiritual, personal 
trainer, all right? You heard of a physical trainer at the gym helps you get strong, right? Spiritual personal trainer will help you to do that spiritually. Let me describe it to you like this. It's a friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. Okay, they'll meet with you five times, five weeks in a row, a couple minutes before church, about 15 to 20 minutes before church, they'll meet with you. Ask, you know, you can ask any questions, that sort of thing, but really they're there to help you to get in a healthy habit of coming to church and to get strong in the ways of the Lord. Now listen, let me make a promise to you guys. Okay, you came to give God all your heart, came to give God all of your life. You need to get healthy in the things of God. So I'm asking you to make a commitment here at The Rock. Give us one year of your life. Okay, one year. Sitting under consistently the teaching here at The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. Getting to as many church services as you can in that year, okay? We have 11 of them a week that you can choose from, okay? So trying to get into two or three of them, all right? You will skyrocket in your walk with God. And at the end of that year and for the rest of your life, you'll look back on that and say, man, that was the best decision. I never knew it could be like this. Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right. It all starts with a spiritual personal trainer. So if you guys will make a left turn, follow Tony right over this way. Let's give him a great big phrase as they go. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.